Today I'm going to talk about what a flood is, definitions of floods, and what flood frequency is and how we calculate it. I will also talk about some of the reasons that flood frequency calculations are imperfect and what we do when we don't have a long stream flow record necessary to calculate flood frequency. But let's start with the really basic question. Uh, what is a flood? So we have a definition as hydrologists and geomorphologists that a flood is any time a river overtops its banks. But the National Weather Service uh, defines several other types of floods. So there are moderate floods, major floods, and then um, as we get into talking about extreme events, we'll also talk about record floods. So what do you suppose the definitions of a moderate flood or a major flood might be? Well, let's use this little landscape that I constructed out of clip art. It is definitely not to scale, right? Corn is not taller than two-story houses. Um, but that sort of shows you a typical land use that you might see um, along a stream. So we might have some floodplain forest and some agriculture and roads and some structures. And then as we get into higher elevations, more structures, uh, houses, commercial development, things like that. So again, a flood is any time the water level is above this orange line that I've just added, because above that level, the river will be spilling out of its banks and onto its floodplain. Uh, and, and maybe, in some cases, the water can rise some distance into the floodplain without really causing much damage. So this is a flood, but it's not a flood that has a major effect on people. However, once we get up to the uh, level at which some structures are inundated, there are roads inundated, uh, there might start to need to be some evacuations, then the National Weather Service would call this a moderate flood. So at this point, we have real damage beginning. There is some damage at lower levels, but more significant damage once we get to a moderate flood. A major flood then um, is defined as one in which there is extensive inundation of structures and roads and significant evacuations of people and or transfer of property to higher of elevations, right? So major floods are pretty major events. They don't tend to happen all that often, but when they do, there's significant disruption associated with them. So what then is a record flood? Well, a record flood is the biggest flood in the historical record for an area. So it might be a really major flood, right, with lots of damage and lots of destruction. Or maybe you're in an area where there isn't a long historical record of flooding, either formally through uh, USGS streamflow records or informally through um, histories and things like that. And so in that case, you could have um, a, what might be a relatively minor event be the record flood because it just happens to be bigger than anything else that you've recorded in the time you've been recording floods in that part of the stream. So if, for example, we have a 10-year stream flow record and most of those years haven't had any moderate or major floods, then we could have in year 11, we could have a flood that's still not moderate or major, but it could be the record flood. On the other hand, we could have a 10-year streamflow record that just happens to have some really large events in it. And then to set a new record flood in that streamflow record, we need something even more extreme. So a couple of different things to keep in mind. The definition to a hydrologist and geomorphologist of a flood is water outside the channel and on the floodplain. The National Weather Service definitions are based on damage to property and hazard to people. And then when you hear the word record flooding, uh, the question you should immediately ask is what record, how long, what sort of range of conditions um, are recorded in that record. All right, so just to give you some examples and pictures, I'm gonna show you uh, 
in today's video uh, quite a bit about the area where I used to live when I was in graduate school, Corvallis, Oregon. Um, so these pictures are from December 1964. The Willamette River is down near the bottom of the picture. You can see quite a bit of flooding happening there in South Town, Corvallis. Lots of water, uh, lots of inundation of structures, problems with bridges, all sorts of damage happening. If we actually look the other way in this picture, now you can see the two big bridges across the Willamette River, even more extensive inundation of farmland and some commercial and houses over on the other side of the river where the riverbank is a slightly lower elevation and the land is a slightly lower elevation. So fun fact, the original location of Corvallis was on this side of the river. It was called Marysville. Uh, but after some early experiences with flooding, they relocated the community to the other side of the river. And even in this 1964 event, most of Corvallis was high and dry. So that is an example of major flooding, right? Fairly obvious uh, sort of event. Um, here is an example more recently, same area, the Willamette River at Corvallis uh, in 2019. This is a moderate flood stage, and here uh, we are just on the east side of the Willamette River looking at some road signs, um, and so you can see some flooding. So I'm just going to go back here for a minute. So those road signs are in about this area right here. The road is dry, some of the surrounding farmland is wet, um, but it's not nearly as extensive an inundation as in the major flooding in 1964. This uh, graph over here is a combination of measured and modeled flood hydrographs. So we can see observations from the USGS here showing the flood peaking um, right at that moderate flood level and then starting to decline in, with a river forecast generated by the National Weather Service using weather data and a hydrologic model um, and then continuing to decline. And so on this graph we see um, the flood stage here in red, moderate flooding in blue, and uh, how high things would need to get uh, for major flooding in purple. And when we are talking about flooding, hydrologists, as always, continue to think about things in terms of discharge in the US, cubic feet per second, in the metric system, cubic meters per second. But if you're interested in, is that road underwater? Is my house gonna be flooded? Then you're interested in stage and the shape of the channel and floodplain in your particular area. And so we see that represented in this flood forecast as well. So that's some examples of flooding on the Willamette River. Let's look at that over time. Uh, so this is a graph of each year's peak stream flow from the USGS gauge at Albany, just downstream of Corvallis, um, going back to the 1800s and up through 2019. And we can see that 1964 flood here, uh, well over 150,000 cubic feet per second. In, uh, but that's small potatoes, even though it was major flooding, it's small potatoes compared to the record flood on the Willamette River in this area, where the peak flow in uh, 1862 was about almost 350,000 cubic feet per second. That's the flood that caused Marysville to relocate to the higher side of the river. But if we look at 2019, and any time really after 1964, you might be asking what happened to the floods? So a big flood in 2019, uh, the moderate flood, is a lot less damaging, a lot lower flow in the river than major floods in the years past. So what happened here after 1964? Well, the answer is that uh, a large number of flood control reservoirs were built on tributaries to the Willamette River, and those flood control reservoirs are able to capture and store runoff in the watershed and reduce the risk of flooding in the downstream Willamette Valley.